Welcome to another episode of GUI Challenges, where I build interfaces my way, and then I challenge you to do it your way. Because with our creative minds combined, we are going to find multiple ways to solve these interfaces and expand the diversity of our skills. Today, we are building a theme switcher that can toggle your site between light and dark. Ooh, cue in that intro. First, a tour. Let's look at our component that we've made here. Um, and it's tiny because usually you have these in the top upper right corner, um, sitting somewhere conveniently in a global space for users to toggle. And let's, one of our first things here, let's open up DevTools. And let's bump up the size on this. I'm gonna go to the button. I have a custom property here called size and let's just bump that up. I'm holding shift and pushing up on my arrow keyboard and boom, we have a ginormous one. So now we can see all of the tiny little details that are going into this. So as you can see, it has a light and a dark theme. There's hover features. Remember, hover should always increase the contrast of something. I think that's really critical. We have a title on there in case something is focusing this and wants to know uh, what its operations are. And of course, you know, we're toggling attributes that are going to make this aware to a screen reader about whether or not it's in a light or a dark state. Let's test out some of our different alt versions that we have, our little variants. So we have a light version and we have a dark version. And notice how as we toggle this value in the browser, it's changing in the page here. And we're going to go over the JavaScript that's listening for that. And I don't think that's necessarily standard for most light and dark theme switchers to watch the system preference if it's changing. This was a stylistic choice of mine that if my computer has just turned itself to a dark theme, or if I explicitly changed it to a dark theme, I would like to see the light theme here change. Now, that might not be the case for all your users. They might want this to stay. Now, it does persist. So like if I have this at no emulation and I switch to light theme and I refresh, it's still going to be in the light theme. If I go to the dark theme and I refresh, it's still in the dark theme. So I'm writing to local storage what your choice is, but I am allowing this global feature here to toggle it. Let's go back to a nice large size. Boop, beep, beep, boop, boop, beep, boop. OK, back to rendering. And let's check out what it's like if we prefer reduced motion. If we prefer reduced motion, we are just going to instant toggle between these. I toyed with many different crossfades and different animations here, and all in all, I felt that it just should be instant. I mean, it was instantly changing in the page already, so why don't I just make this instantly change? And so we have, in this tiny little component, a lot of little things to manage. We have to manage the current color set, and we have to manage whether or not there's motion or no motion. And it turns out that these things create a little matrix of state that we have to handle, and it's no shortage of complexity. So let's go back to no emulation and go back to our elements. And so now that we've kind of seen a general overview, like if I tab in here and hit spacebar, you know, I'm going to get the same toggle behavior that I would get if I was clicking it. Let's look at how this is working, because while the component is very tiny, uh, it has a lot of functionality. And it starts with the page load and how we start loading the page. And so before we go any further, though, we have to check out the debugging corner. We have to see it working in all the different browsers, don't we? Here's Firefox here. If I zoom in, Command plus, Command plus, Command plus. You can see it's working very nice, nice and smooth. Here it is on iPad, changing the whole color scheme. Here's Safari, iOS Safari. Nice Android toggling, animating, Chrome toggling and animating. Whew. Looking good. Now it's time to go look at the code. And we're going to do this one HTML first. That's right. We are going to start in the HTML. And the reason is, is we're toggling an attribute on the HTML document so that all the styles and all the elements in the page can know about the um, theme that the user is desiring here, whether it's light or dark. And so we have to indicate in our document. Now, when the document is written, or as I wrote it, it has none. And so it's going to be light by default. What we do, though, is load a script. And notice the script is here about as high as it can go up in the loading waterfall. We want this to load right away because theme toggle is going to go look at the current local storage state. It's going to look at the user preference state. It's going to decide what attribute to add into the HTML document here. And once that HTML attribute gets added, all of the appropriate styles for the page can load. And we want to do this as early as possible so that we don't see a flash of white or a flash of dark when we're in a different theme. So it's kind of critical that this gets put up here. Notice there's no attribute here saying defer or async. It's not a type module. We need this script to load synchronously. We need it to read what's in here. It's a small script and apply those attributes. To observe this, let's go back to Chrome, go to our elements tab. I'm going to find the HTML tag. Since this is where we're setting the attribute, I'm going to right click. I'm going to say break on attribute modification. We want to know when something has changed this. And I can reload the page 
and it takes me to the line of JavaScript in the theme toggle file that is changing the value. And then I can go look at the call stack. So look, window.load. So the script loaded uh, asynchronously. Well, it loaded it asynchronously, but it's going to execute all the things inside of it synchronously. We'll have a window on load. So window on load has fired. And now we're reflecting a preference. And when we reflect this preference, we're looking for the document first element child, which you can see here is the HTML tag. We're setting the attribute to data theme to the theme dot value. And the theme dot value is something, it's just some internal state to the script. So that is the initial loading of the page. Now things continue to happen. So if I hit play, we can now go to the document and see the data theme dark is there. And if I click again, we can see that reflecting the preference, it's another place that we're going to set that. So this is where the attributes being set. This is how we can trace that down. And so now that we know that the page is loading, we're synchronously loading a script. We're synchronously setting an attribute so that our first paint is nice and clear. We can go check out the rest of the HTML and work our way from like top to bottom of how this component, which looks so tiny, is packing such a punch. So I'm going to play through that, go back to the elements, break on nothing. So now we're no longer going to stop whenever that attribute is changed. And it looks like we need to go increase our button size again up to do, 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 do something nice and big, 62. Awesome. Switch to dark, switch to light. Awesome. We'll go back to the HTML and we can see it, we have a, some styles loading afterwards. So these are going to be loaded synchronously also because it needs to have these in order to get the page rendered. And then we have a button. So our button has a class theme toggle. We have an ID of theme toggle and we have a title that says toggles light and dark with an ARIA label set to auto because when the page loads, this is set to auto. We can also right click our button, say break on attribute modifications and click it and see that just after we're reflecting the preference on the HTML tag, we are reflecting the preference on the actual theme toggle button itself. Kind of neat, right? I love being able to set element breakpoints. Really cool stuff. Okay, back to our HTML. We have a button. That's what's giving it all those um, you know, focus highlights, and it's just a very interactive element. We get a lot of good stuff for free. We did sort of switch it into a switch here. We're, we're giving it this ARIA label. And here, let's even look over here. What's the ARIA label say? ARIA label light, right. And if I play through my debugger breakpoint and I click again, ARIA label light, ARIA label dark. So we have the data theme and the ARIA label in sync being set from the same spot in our JavaScript. And again, we're going to go over that here in just a bit, but let's look at more of the HTML. Inside of our button is where things kind of get really fun with SVG, right? Okay, so here's our SVG tag right here. It has a class called sun and moon. It's aria hidden true because this is presentational. The state of it is actually stashed in the button above. And we have a width and a height set to 24. This is just some defaults when it loads. Same thing with the view box. So here we have a mask. And we'll talk about that in a second. Just know that that's the moon. And we have a circle that represents the sun. And we have um, some sunbeams with a bunch of lines in here. Now notice the current color usage, and this is just so in case no styles load, this button still looks pretty good. It's very usable. Um, and it, again, will have the attributes indicating what its current state is. But if we look closely here, so here's the sun, this center element, let's twirl open our SVG. Let's pull down our styles here so we can kind of look at what's in here. Here's our circle sun. Notice it's got a CX and CY and a radius of six. So we're sort of centering it inside of this 24 by 24 view box, giving it a radius of six, saying there's a mask called moon mask, and there's its color. Here's our sunbeams. We can twirl through each of these. Here's all of our lines. Very cool. And they're all positioned pretty particularly. Now, I got this icon from Feather Icons, and so I just took the um, SVG right out of it. I did end up doing some modifications in order to make the mask work, but we'll, we'll get into that here in just a second. And actually, let's go look at the mask. The mask here is called moon. But it has two items inside. In order to make a mask, you need black and white. And so here's our rect that fills the entire viewport space. So it's at 0, 0, width and height filling the space. Current uh, color is set to white to fill. And then the mask itself. And notice how you can see it's pushed off to the side. And that's when we click, we just moved the mask in. And when we move the mask in, we cut off the sun shape because the sun shape is pointing to that mask. And we, um, since we've also scaled up this circle, see scale 1.75, that's where some, maybe some of the mismatch is coming here with DevTools. And we go back and all we're doing to go from a sun, so we really, we have one icon, it's a sun icon that we, with a little bit of CSS, tweak into a moon by almost sort of um, eclipsing it with a mask. And it's just a really cool effect. And that is the gist of the effect here. 
and we can go dive into some more of the CSS and the JavaScript now that you know that that's the operations here. And we can even go into the animations here. Let's click and click. And if we pop into here and grab our little time handle, we can see in slow motion what's happening. So there's our, our uh, eclipse moving out. So that's our mask. We're moving out. It's one of the first things that happened in that animation. Next, the sunbeams are rotating and they're transitioning in with their opacity. So you can see that here. And look at their different curves. This The sunbeams rotating have this bounce effect. See how they kind of overshoot a little bit and then come back? That's a nice easing function that came from open props. We have an opacity, just like a nice normal easing. And then the transform on the scale on the sun is also bouncing a little bit in the same way that the um, little sunbeams are, are going. So kind of cool. It looks like there's a little bit of a bug here in scrubbing this, that, like it's resetting this position, probably because it's current state. But anyway, I think you get a nice visual about like how that's happening and what the timing is. So all three of these are taking the same amount of time and we're moving the circle out even faster. Now, if we look at this one, so this is as we transition from the sun to the moon, we're going to scale up the sun. We're going to transform and fade out the sunbeams. Notice how they go out some of the soonest. And then as soon as that scale animation is approaching its finish, whew, we start moving in our eclipsing moon. And then we get our effect. I just love when you can see things in slow-mo. We can even just uh, here, so pause or play, pause or play. And let's hit 10% on this and um, play our animation once that time head has reached the end. Look at that. Shoo! Little bounce comes back. Back from whence it came. A nice little eclipsing. All right, let's set that back to 100%. We are ready to dive into the rest of the details. Here is index.css where I'm importing theme toggle.css and I'm setting a custom media variable called motion OK. So let's go look at theme toggle.css. Here in theme toggle.css, I'm importing sun and moon. So I've separated the theme toggle button. So here, if I just collapse this, everything's kind of stuck right here in this theme toggle. But the sun and moon CSS has its own file. I just felt it was nice to break it out. So if we review this button first, theme toggle, we set a size. That's what we saw. I was editing nice and easy to change the size. We even use this down here at the bottom. Look, we say, if there's no hover ability on this device that's visiting, how about we bump up the size of that sun and moon? So it's a little bit easier for a stylus or a finger to touch. Kind of cool little effect from using custom properties. Then the parent element here, so this theme toggle button defines the fill colors and the hover colors. So here's a nice like bluish dark black So because we're low on the lightness and we're in the sort of blue range here. And then we fill hover. We want to increase the contrast, so we're going to make it even darker. And this must be, oh, this is the light theme. So this is like a pretty dark gray, and this is a super dark gray. And then let's see in our data theme dark. Yep. So here we're using at nest. This is allowing us to specify a new selector. So the selector begins with data theme dark and then brings in our dot theme toggle here. So it's data theme dark dot theme toggle. And then I can change the icon fill and the icon fill hover. The reason we're using the attribute here to toggle our colors is because we're stashing the preference of the user's operating system or their client side choice into a variable, which we then put on the HTML document. So we're no longer using the media queries to watch for the switching. We're watching this attribute. And at nest makes it really easy to keep that context here inside of my uh, initial selector block for this theme toggle. And I'm setting this to a pretty light uh, gray, 70% uh, lightness. And then I'm bumping it all the way up to 90% on hover. And that's here. You can see it. It's like a nice gray, and then it's almost white. It's a nice gray, and it's almost white. So we're making sure that we're passing contrast in all those states. But always, again, when you're hovering or interacting with something, make it easier to see. Make it easier to find. Don't push it away and make it look like it's disappearing or becoming disabled. OK, next up, we've got uh, some of the generic styles for this button. We've got a background set to none. We're pretty much stripping everything off of it. We're saying border, background none, padding none. We're setting the size to that custom property, aspect ratio to one. That's going to give us a perfect square in case this wasn't good enough here, the inline size and block size. And we're setting the border radius to 50%. And whenever that's used with a square, you get a nice circle. I'm setting a couple of styles here to help mouse users. So we have a cursor touch, uh, cursor pointer. So a mouse user will see that this is an interactive button. We'll get the little hand. We have touch action manipulation, which in case you don't have other attributes on your document or whatever, this can make your tap feel much faster as this button is not going to be accepting gestures. You're not going to pinch in on this button or flick or fling on this button. So we can turn that to manipulation, and it means the interactions with this won't be waiting for double taps and stuff like that. They can fire much faster. Super rad. 
And then we have WebKit tab highlight color transparent, and that's so on Safari. When we tap, we're not going to see the sort of semi-transparent overlay that's trying to help us understand that you interacted with something. Um, we are doing that work ourselves, so I disable it here by setting that color to transparent. Then I have an outline offset to five pixels. I just love doing that because then when you tab into this uh, here, tab in, you get a nice offset of that outline. It's not going to hug and shrink wrap. It's going to give it a little bit of breathing room. Then we target the nested SVG inside of here and we say, hey, fill my space and make sure your stroke line caps are round. I love this effect. It just makes everything look more rounded in here. If we go back to here, we can see that these are rounded. They're rounded at the tops and the bottoms. So that's really where that's becoming important. And that is it for the theme toggle, which leaves us to sun and moon. The sun and moon imports from open props just the easings. And those easings are what make it really easy for us to do the bounce and stuff. And we'll see that in a second. So here's our sun and moon selector. So this is going to, again, we're going to put all of our styles inside of this selector with nesting. And that's going to help us keep the scope inside of here. And the first thing that we do is we target the moon, the sun, and the sunbeams, and we say, your transform origin should be center. When I scale you, when I move you, I want you to do that from the center or rotate you, right? Those, um, those sunbeams need to rotate from the center. Then we've got here, if it's the sun and the moon, so we're selecting sun and moon in one nice little selector with is, we're setting the fill to the icon fill. And we're at nesting with theme toggle is being hovered or focused, find this sun and moon and give them an updated fill to the icon fill hover kind of a fun little selector and operation there. Then we have the sunbeams. Now the sunbeams aren't going to use a fill, they're going to use a stroke. So we set the sunbeam stroke to icon fill, same that we were doing up above with the fill. We set the stroke width to two pixels, and just like we did above, this time though we're going to set the stroke to icon fill hover. So that's what's handling that is the parent is managing these values, and the child has the option to like use these in its uh, display. So kind of cool, there's how the sunbeams are being colored. And that's the light theme. So notice there's no um, data theme dark or data theme light here. So the default styles for this toggle button are going to be light. And we're going to nest, right? We have at nest again. Here's our new selector that's then going to pull in the context. And the context is sun and moon. So data theme, sun and moon, and the sun. So if this is the dark theme, the sun needs to be scaled up. We saw that in our design. We need the sunbeams to be opacity zero, right? It's the moon state, so we don't want sunbeams. And the moon, its circle mask, needs to be transformed. So we're going to transform and we're going to translate that into position. So that's going to bring it into the space, and that mask will then mask over that sun shape. And that's what gives us that effect here. I do have this at supports CX1. This is checking to see if the browser can animate an actual um, position of the like SVG shape itself. And if it can, I'm not going to transform anymore. I'm going to use the um, CX position. And I found in Chrome I was getting some better performance here. So there's some interesting performance implications of transitioning a mask in and out. And I was able to kind of pacify and make all browsers high performant by using this little trick here. I bet there's a better way to do that. All right, let's toggle this down. So that's just the dark style. So that was essentially how we converted from a sun to a moon. And the last step we have is to handle motion. And so if motion is OK, we're going to target the sun and say, hey, transition your transform over half a second and use this elastic easing. And that's what gives it that bounce and that overshot, that whoosh, and it kind of comes back. Then we target the sunbeams and we say, you should transition your transform over half of a second using elastic 4 and your opacity over half a second using ease 3. So if motion is OK and we're in the light theme essentially here still, um, we're going to be transitioning these values. And here's our moon. So if the moon and its mask, we're going to transition its transform unless we're trying to transition the CX value at which we'll transition the CX value here. Next is dark theme. So again, just from like top to bottom really quick, we've got our light theme, our dark theme, our light theme motion OK, and then our dark theme motion OK. So if this is the dark theme and we're animating, here's our sun. We want to transform the scale, so we're going to scale boost it up. We're going to transition the timing function with ease 3, and we're going to transition over a quarter of a second. Our sunbeams are going to rotate, and they're going to transition over 0.15 seconds. And our circle is going to transition with a delay uh, over half a second into its new location. So we were able to kind of section out the different states that this needed to be in using nesting and using a nice little controlled set of styles to really make the light and the dark and the light and the dark motion and no motion combinations pretty easy to manage. Okay, hopefully you're like, I get it. It was a sun and then you animated a mask in and it made it a moon. But there's a whole bunch of JavaScript we have to go over to make this actually work. So instead of it just toggling visibly, 
we need its change event and its click events and the page load and all these other things to feed into the value that the page saves so that the user has a very, very transparent experience. So let's dive into that here in theme toggle JS. The first value I stash is a storage key. So this is in case anything is getting or setting from the local storage. This is our little namespace. I just called it theme preference. And we have an on click function that we're stashing here. On click is just going to be flipping the current value, the theme dot value, which is something we're going to be stashing internally down here. Here's const theme value. We're going to set that value equal to, well, the opposite of whatever it is now. So the theme dot value, if it's light, we're going to set it to dark. Otherwise, we'll set it to light because that must have been dark. And then we'll set the preference and we'll get into that in a second. So on click, we're really just flipping the current value and then calling a function to set preference. We have a get color preference function. And this says, if the local storage has this key in it, then return the value of it. So if it's there, then retrieve it and return it from this function. Otherwise, the window should go look and to see. Uh, it basically, we're using JavaScript to make a media query. And we're saying, hey, what's the current color preference? Is it dark or is it light? Um, well, really, what we're asking is, hey, is the current uh, theme that they prefer dark? And this comes back as true or false. And if that's true, we just explicitly return dark. And if not, we return light. So instead of returning whether or not this matches, this function is, again, it's returning the current preference. So whether or not that preference is stashed in local storage or we're getting it for the first time from the user's preference here, this is where we're getting those values from. So this function is returning light or dark. Then we have set preference. This is going to go to local storage. It's going to set an item, use our storage key, and set it to the theme.value. And it's going to reflect that preference. And we saw that reflect preference function earlier, which was setting the va like the attribute value on our HTML element. And we have it setting it on the actual button itself so that screen readers can know the current state of the light and dark setting. Here is our theme that we're setting. This is our just our object with a value in it. And we call reflect preference right off the bat. So when this script loads, right, we're loading this synchronously at page load. It's going to put all these functions into memory, stash this into memory. It's going to call get color preference, which is going to go initially grab something here. It's going to look again in the local storage or the user's preference, come back and set that as the value. Then we're going to reflect right away. And we're doing this early, so no page flashes. CSS is going to be made aware, right? That HTML attribute will be on the document as soon as that CSS file loads, and it can go on its first paint effectively. Reflect preference. We looked at that already. So let's look at window.onload. So window.onload sets onload so screen readers can see the latest value. Right. When we reflect this preference and we're doing it that early in the HTML document way up here, and this is essentially all that's been read so far by the browser. It doesn't know that this button even exists. So even though we reflected the preference, there was no button there to be reflected on, only the document. So we early tell the document what to be, but we have to wait till on load so that we know that the button is there to go reflect the preference again and set it on the button itself. Now, this script can find and listen for clicks on the control. And so document query selector, here's our theme toggle, add event listener click on click. So it's going to call our click function, which toggles it. And last, down here, hiding, we're going to sync with the system changes. So we're going to say window.matchmedia. We're looking to see um, if it's light or dark. We're going to add a listener for whether or not it's dark. When it changes, we want to know is dark or not. This is the whole query is only testing to see if it's changed and if it's dark. So we want to know if it's dark, the theme value. If it's dark, then set it to dark, else set it to light. So similar to how we were just returning light and dark from our um, preference query up above, we're going to do it here in this listener. And then we're going to set the preference. And the set of preference is here. We set it to local storage. We reflect the preference up into our HTML document and down into our button. Whew. And that is the extent of this theme toggle. I thought theme toggles were easy, but no, they are not. They're jam packed with all sorts of options, all sorts of things to be worried about. How are you building these? Are you setting an attribute on your HTML document? Are you just loading different script files with JavaScript? There's so many different ways to do this. I'm really excited to see how you're doing it. I hope you liked this animation. There's lots of little things in here. I know we looked at the, you know, the these and, and kind of checked them out. But you can see how different easings and different durations and like a delay or not can really change the way that something feels. Like this delay on this uh, mask coming in, it's really critical. Oh, look, I think it's because we're here. We'll just clear out of there. Yeah, it's really critical that that delay on the eclipse comes in later. It just a lot of little things go into making this feel that smooth and that beautiful. So thanks for watching this GUI challenge. I hope you enjoyed this one and stay tuned for the next one. I look forward to all your submissions and see you later, y'all.